Let's have Brad Hunt, John DeVree, and John McCarran take their respective places. Let's give them a round of applause. If you have questions for the gentleman, uh, you have little uh, uh, sheets on your, on your uh, table. Make sure you give them the questions are short and they're legible. And uh, you guys are all organized how you're going to do this. Yep. Let the games begin. They are. Thank you, uh, Professor Green. Good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Brad Hunt. I want to start by thanking a few people. Thank Father Ryan for that wonderful uh, prayer for us this morning. I also have a few other people to thank. The American Planning Association, which is headquartered in Chicago, commissioned our book. And uh, they, uh, uh, they, are, uh, they made this book possible. It's part of a series of books on the state of planning in cities across North America. Ours is the second. Uh, Los Angeles was first. Atlanta is next. And so we look forward to the series. Roosevelt University, thank you for your support on various fronts. I could go on about that. But I'd like to also acknowledge Lambda Alpha International, which is a fraternity focused on land use, which made a generous grant to support, support our book. But most of all, I want to thank uh, the City Club of Chicago for this opportunity to begin a broad civic dialogue about the role of city planning in Chicago's future. John and I will be making several arguments today, and I want to outline those for you first, and then we're going to elaborate on each of them. We're going to take turns presenting today. First, Chicago once planned with confidence. Many think of Daniel Burnham and the 1909 plan of Chicago. But we're going to argue that 1958 to 1974 was a crucial period of robust city planning that put us on the trajectory to the global city that we live in today. This was a, a, a period that we could uh, embrace again today. Second, jobs matter, and Chicago has been innovative in industrial policy, and John will talk about uh, that effort. We revived the central area of Chicago through planning in part, in part through planning, and that's a tremendous success story when compared to other Midwestern Rust Belt cities. But we are resting on our laurels, we argue, and not protecting those gains and not thinking about how we're going to grow for the next 30 years. Further, Chicago still struggles with how to revive many of our neighborhoods. We risk falling into what Mayor Rahm Emanuel recently called a tale of two cities, with a thriving central area and north side on the one hand and wide swaths of depressed neighborhoods elsewhere. So we face real challenges in the city, both in the neighborhoods, demographic challenges, fiscal challenges, and to tackle these challenges, we need to reinvigorate city planning and produce a new comprehensive plan, one that covers not just land use questions, but issues of health care, education, crime, parks, all the elements that make for a high quality of life in our city. Right now, we lack the capacity to plan, and Chicago does not have a Department of City Planning, and it has not done a comprehensive plan since 1966. Other cities have planned wisely and comprehensively. Chicago once had a strong vision for our future, and I'm going to describe that, but today uh, we lack one. Chicago's future depends on coming up with a plan for strategically allocating our resources and how to promote widespread economic development and how to tackle all these challenging problems. City planning is not a panacea. It's not going to solve everything, but every health Every healthy corporation, every nonprofit, every school has a strategic vision, a strategic plan for its future. Chicago lacks that today, and it's a challenge to all of us in this room. So I'm going to walk through the first period when Chicago planned confidently. I'm going to start with this image. Richard J. Daley uh, came to power in 1955, and he immediately consolidated uh, a lot of planning activities in the mayor's office. He created the Chicago Buildings Commission. He pushed through zoning reform, and he created the city's first Department of City Planning. He worked with a growth coalition, and they're pictured here. These are the, the downtown business interests, the real estate interests, the leaders of the city to craft a vision for the next 30 years. Here's the mayor in the middle here, uh, and pointing to a model. 
Yes, where else? Uh, pointing to a model of uh, the 1958 development plan for the central area of the city. And he loved this model. The mayor moved it to his office. There are other pictures where he's pointing to it. People come in and he'd say, look what we're going to build here, look what we're going to build there. And much of this vision uh, came to fruition over the next 30 to 40 years. The development plan for the central area of Chicago uh, called for a compact accessible loop, one where uh, that, that would protect the, the downtown. Remember, this is a time when people are fleeing to the suburbs, when many cities, uh, it wasn't clear what the future of cities was going to be. He's calling for 50,000 new residents downtown. Again, a radical idea uh, in the 1950s. Residents living right around the core of the city. Called for a new University of Illinois campus, initially on rail yards south of the city. Uh, that's going to get moved. Uh, but also called for transit expansion at a time when most cities are, again, building highways. We are, we're one of the few to expand our transit system in the 50s and 60s. And this uh, helps, if you can't understand Chicago today without understanding this planet, it's an obscure planet, it didn't have the pretty pictures of Burnham, but things like Marina City are directly uh, coming out of this plan in the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, these are major investments to, to uh, really energize the central area. The period of robust planning continued with the 1966 Comprehensive Plan of Chicago. This one covered the whole city, not just the downtown central area. It laid out a series of visions, policies, priorities in broad, broad strokes, not looking at what's going to go on what corner where, but thinking about how are we going to make Chicago a better city. It included follow-on ideas that were going to then be pursued over a period of a decade uh, that were really going to help define the city in ways uh, that we love today. It also included 16 sub-area plans, so the idea is you build a comprehensive plan with the, the broad vision and then you start drilling down to the neighborhoods. Uh, the 66 plan covered uh, the whole wide range of things that we think of. It's not just a land use plan, uh, housing, uh, health, industry, parks, education. This is, you, if you don't connect these dots, then you have a, very, a lot of little plans. Um, the regulatory follow-on plans from the 1966 plan were as important. These are the things called for in the plan that eventually are going to happen over the next decade. The lakefront plan of 1972, which protected that very valuable asset to the city. It called for some crazy islands around here. Those weren't built. Um, but it set up a regulatory framework for development along the lakefront. The River Edge plan was also a, a, an outgrowth of the uh, the 1966 Comprehensive Plan, it called for really embracing the river for the first time. It was no longer going to be a dump, it was going to be a city asset. There were other follow-on plans, the Illinois uh, air rights uh, regulations that allowed for redevelopment of rail yards, the Landmarks Preservation Ordinance was called for in the plan and eventually emerges from it. So these are things we don't really walk around and see, but they were vital planning efforts to think about our future. And finally, uh, in, the, in terms of 1966, the Chicago 21 plan was the last of the sub-area plans, and it called for uh, another round of development downtown. It further uh, developed that idea of planning uh, to bring residents downtown. It turned rail yards here in red into things like Dearborn Park and eventually uh, Museum Campus. So uh, this was a period when Chicago was planning robustly, uh, planning aggressively, and it, it reaped, reaped huge dividends for the city. By 1983, we produced another central area plan. We've now gone almost 20 years without a, a, a comprehensive plan. This one uh, was not done by the city, but done by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. It called for a number of developments, but the main centerpiece was a World's Fair, uh, and it signaled that we were now going for kind of grand, big ideas, that uh, Hail Mary passes, if you will, uh, to, 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 to spur development. And this was kind of a, we call the beginning of the end of, of a comprehensive and bold city-led effort, and it turns into the privatization of planning. We argue that you need a public presence um, in the planning effort if you're going to do it robustly and aggressively. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about industrial policy, and then we'll be back. Thank you, Brad. Uh, while all of this demographic turmoil was going on, um, the hallmark slogan of the 1966 plan was, how are we going to prevent white flight? This was, the, this was the state that the demographics were in for Chicago. But accompanying that was also a continued erosion of jobs, working class jobs. 
And the, the uh, recession of 1981-1982 just tipped what was already uh, a structural a breakdown of the steel industry and we lost in just a matter of a few years tens of thousands of jobs on the south side. Harold Washington was elected shortly after that recession uh, with much more of an emphasis on jobs and neighborhood development versus some of the larger projects you've heard about and certainly versus some of the central area ideas. And within a year of being elected, he, he produced a, a major plan focused on job creation at the neighborhood level, which then ended up dovetailing and I would say laying the groundwork for what became a, a planned manufacturing district or an industrial corridor strategy for the city. Uh, remember, there were no federal plans going on to address this kind of structural uh, breakdown of industry in the Midwest. There were really no meaningful state programs. And this is an example of the city stepping up in a very brave and unorthodox way. Uh, there were a series of task forces set up with the chamber to try to save the steel industry, for the apparel industry, and so on and so forth. But the strategy that took root was one that really, bent, uh, really was focused on the city's str strength in land planning. And uh, so a series of zoning changes were put in to create some exclusively manufacturing. North Branch really led the way. Uh, there was some uh, groundbreaking research done. And, and we argue with, with some large degree of success. Uh, the building you see at the top is the new Wrigley Innovation Center, their worldwide research center. On the lower left <coughs> was the saving of Finkel and the rebuilding of Finkel Steel at Southport. And then most recently on the bottom right is the new Finkel plant in Burnside, uh, which was going to leave and go to Quebec. And the city was able to work with them, retrieve them, and they're now quadrupling their steel production down there. So we've, so we've had some successes. I think there's a good argument for, but for the city's uh, efforts, this, this wouldn't have happened. Uh, under Valerie Jarrett, we also took some really bold steps to expand that strategy. Uh, by the time she left, we had done three quarters of opportunity studies, and we had 24 industrial quarters. And the last of the big plans in the industrial sector was bringing in Calumet. Uh, and this, this, this resulted from a whole series of plans. In 97, the city did a citywide plan. And one of the conclusions was, we've got a lot of pressure on land use in the north. Why aren't we trying to do more aggressive reuse of the sites on the south? So that led to an economic development plan for that area, designating certain sites, which led to the creation of the biggest TIF in the history of the city, 13,000 acres. Uh, and then eventually, EPA came in and said, let's do help fund a land use plan. Uh, Patty, you worked on this. Some of these see familiar faces who worked on this. Uh, but the punchline to this is, uh, it really prepared us for an unusual opportunity. Uh, Ford Motor Company uh, let it be known that they wanted to build their first auto supplier park in North America. And uh, uh, the, the darling of the, of the uh, boardroom in Detroit was this was going to go to Atlanta, nice greenfield site, low labor costs, low electricity, the union wasn't as strong, what have you. Um, uh, but Chicago decided uh, working with the planning department and a, and a consulting team, we put together a package in about 90 days, which said Chicago can be competitive. And we never would have been able to do this if we hadn't already had in place a thoroughfare plan, a TIF, a land use plan, because we had already identified the old Republic Steel site as a place for an auto supplier park, and we'd already pre-designed a connecting road that would connect the Ford plant to it. So in 90 days, with the help of a very innovative center, Center Point Properties came in and optioned the site. Uh, we were able to, uh, to win this. And up on the upper left-hand side, for those of you who may have not have been down here, we now have 1.6 million square feet of auto suppliers located down there, and it's, and it's expanding. You may want to know about the plant, that it's, uh, it's a flex line, and they are doing three shifts 24-7. Uh, and the employment at the plant's gone from 2,200 to 4,000, even with the addition of a lot of robots. So uh, we've become a manufacturing center, at least in one of our core corridors. Again, uh, another example of the kind of longer range system oriented planning that we're advocating in the book is the Chicago Region Environmental and Transportation Efficiency Program known as CREATE uh, through, I think, a series of innovation, innovative planning uh, led by then CATS uh, and CDOT uh, and working then with uh, IDOT and METRA and so on and so forth. Uh, six railroads and all these public agencies came together to sign a pact to get rid of Chicago's worst railroad bottlenecks 
uh, to handle all the great freight traffic coming through Chicago, where the, where the logistics center, but also to free up the metro lines and the CTE lines where we were conflicted. We're about halfway through this $3 billion program. Again, a good example, long-term systematic growth. Uh, has the corridor plan uh, been a wholesale success? Uh, we, we would say no. Uh, but has it produced things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to do? We would say yes. Uh, manufacturing, could, could any plan have stopped the decline in manufacturing? Uh, possibly not. But what it did do was uh, stabilize it in certain key areas. But we probably need to take a fresh look at this. Uh, when you look at where the job growth has been, it's now moving into new kinds of jobs. And this may be a program where, again, a comprehensive citywide look. They have a Chicago Sustainable Industries Initiative underway. Maybe we, we need to retune the strategy. There may be 10 or 12 quarters we need to focus on. There may be some new types of jobs we need to focus on. Uh, I want to pivot now to the central area. Uh, between that 1983 slide of the World's Fair that, uh, that Brad just showed you and 2003, uh, we kind of struggled about whether we were going to do another central area plan. We did kind of a pre-plan in the early 90s. We did another one in the mid-90s. We focused our attention in the 90s upon uh, tearing out the State Street Mall. Planners do make mistakes. <laughs> and uh, we spent a lot of money putting it in. We spent a lot of money taking it out. Uh, dedicated bus lanes. We'll talk about that again. But, um, but we didn't get around to any systematic planning until the late 90s. And the business community at that point became concerned about an interesting issue. And that is, as Brad mentioned to you, the goals of the 58 and 66 plan were attracting people to the downtown. And by 2000, by 19, late 1990s, we were attracting people to the downtown in droves. And the cry became, let's rezone swaths of the downtown for office only. Because uh, we need to protect this land uh, against residents coming in and complaining about the trucks unloading at night and uh, construction of these office towers and so on and so forth. Uh, so a series of plans were quickly done. And that's really the background to this 03 plan. Um, and the plans, the plans uh, focused on, do we have enough land supply? And we concluded we did if we would raise the densities around the key transportation nodes, which really fed very nicely into the 2004 zoning reform. One of the successful efforts we want to talk about some more, man, we get into questions and answers. The city accomplished a comprehensive reform of its zoning ordinance with public hearings in every part of the city, did it in two years. So we're kind of saying, don't tell us we couldn't do it again if we wanted to do some really serious comprehensive planning, because this the zoning reform really was a, a, a citywide uh, planning effort. But back to this, uh, at the time Skidmore did an analysis of land supply and we said increased densities, that happened. But the real constriction was we were running out of transit capacity on key lines during work trips. Uh, and we were also running out of pedestrian capacity downtown. So there was a series of very fairly bold transit expansion decisions. The most opulent one of, of was the West Loop Transportation Center with the idea that we could accommodate high speed rail on the lower level. A uh, new system of transitways in the middle, and so on and so forth. This is the one that Richard M. Daly liked the best of all the recommendations in the plan. A big project. So, um, but nonetheless, it pointed out the need that we were running out of space and capacity at, at Union Station and Ogilvy, and and I know that's currently under study. And we, but we haven't come up with any really long-term solutions. It also proposed a series of transitways, grade separated, to handle pedestrian traffic and to finally connect our state's top tourism facility, Navy Pier, to, to a transit connection in McCormick Place, uh, and also to accommodate rush hour east-west traffic in a grade separated corridor under Monroe Street. So um, several years still passed, and in, the, in this decade, we experienced some, some really strong growth. Residential, which has started going north, went west out to United Center, went south into the loop, into those great railroad yard pictures that, uh, that Brad showed you. Uh, grocery stores followed. We opened Millennium Park. All of a sudden, we had hotel uh, redevelopment and deep new development going back into the loop, not just North Michigan. So a lot of change was going on. So how were we going to accommodate all this growth without having uh, put into practice a lot of the recommendations, the capacity enhancement recommendations of the central area plan? So uh, this is a summary. Not surprisingly, most of the recommendations focused on transportation. This is a, a summary. This is a, a new red line subway in the West Loop going down Clinton Street. Uh, the three transitways, new bridges in the South Loop crossing the river to open up all the open land down there. Uh, finally, construction of the Wells Wentworth connector. Uh, replacement of a lot of the CTA stations we tore out 
in the, in the late 40s and early 50s. What happened, in that, what happened with that plan? Um, does this picture resemble one you've seen earlier before? This is um, from the same vantage point as the 1983 plan. And this was, the city became and the mayor became very fetched with the idea we could attract an Olympics. And the business community hardly stepped in. Um, we're not saying we're opposed to that. I went down to Daly Plaza hoping we'd get it just like everybody else. But I think um, the way it was positioned, uh, not connected to some of the long-term improvements that the action plan was calling for, maybe made it uh, seem a little bit of a lightweight bit by not connecting to some long-term improvements to go with it. So uh, it was kind of the perfect tsunami for uh, releasing a grand plan. Chicago had waited uh, 25 years for a new central area plan with a, a relevant list of projects that could be implemented with price tags on them. And within months of each other, we lost the bid. Uh, Lee Bay, who was uh, advising the mayor at that time on planning, asked uh, Richard M. He said, what are we going to do now? We've lost the Olympics. And he says, no money from the feds, no money from the state. Um, so uh, the action plan kind of fell on, fell on an empty coffer. Uh, and within months, the mayor announced his retirement. And as we all know, the real estate bubble, which had started to unravel at that point, the real estate bubble really unraveled dramatically for Chicago. So I'm going to turn back to neighborhoods. So we've revived the central area, but now we still have the challenge of how to revive many of our neighborhoods. And the struggles, I want to outline kind of uh, the struggles with neighborhood planning in this period and go through uh, several wide pendulum sw swings, if you will, uh, in this period. We went through one end of this pendulum here, urban renewal, where the vision was to wipe everything away, a very top-down strategy. There was a strong backlash against that, and we swung the pendulum over here and said that the only uh, viable or the only legitimate planning was one done from the neighborhood up. And I we would argue that in, in the 1990s and in the last decade, we've finally seen the pendulum swing back to the middle, where we can marry, if you will, uh, the community-based planning with professional planning in ways that I, we find uh, uh, optimistic about our future. Urban renewal. This was uh, an effort heavily funded by the federal government in the 1950s, the federal bulldozer. This is an image from Chicago's south side. We wiped away entire neighborhoods and thought we would rebuild them in often in kind of high-rise form. This was deeply damaging to the urban fabric. African Americans, off, most often affected, deeply resented uh, the destruction of their neighborhoods, and it often didn't work the way we had hoped. And as a result, there was a backlash to this, uh, and the rise in many ways of community development corporations, community development organizations like the Woodlawn organizations shown here, that decided, we're going to do it ourselves. Stay away. Uh, we don't need top-down planning. We're able to do this on our own. Now, uh, there were a lot of eff strong efforts to do this. Communities were very effective often at taking a building here, a building there, and doing really good work in renovating housing. But when the MacArthur Foundation in the 1990s surveyed the vast, uh, this, this vast space of community development corporations, they found that there was an excessive emphasis on housing. This was where you can get money. You can get money from Washington to redo a, to renovate a housing development and make it affordable. But the broader community issues around crime, education, jobs, all those, that comprehensive kind of planning was not happening at the neighborhood level. Lots of little community development corporations were acting on their own, uh, but not producing the kind of uh, a broader look that was essential if we were going to move forward. And so, uh, MacArthur, along with the local initiatives support corporation, created the New Communities Program. And they walked neighborhoods through what they called a quality of life planning process. This is a very structured planning process. This wasn't open-ended community meetings. This was, we have goals here for each of these meetings. They're going to be facilitated uh, and coordinated with professional planners. But the goal was to get the voice of the community and then to, to organize it and shape it. And these were done in partnership with community development corporations, in partnership with neighborhood groups, in a way that would produce a document, a plan for the community that then the community could rally behind. Here's an image from a, the lengthy Englewood plan, finished in 2005. 
And the Englewood plan covered not just land use, but it covered a lot of stuff about relations with the police, about schools, about uh, jobs, and all those areas, again, that, that make up our quality of life. But here, finally, the people of Englewood could say, here's a document that reflects our thinking, our vision, what we would like to see, and then that could be shopped around to funders and developers and the like. Is this, is this gonna save Englewood, as we know, a, a very deeply troubled community? No, but for the first time, Englewood had a plan uh, since the 1960s in a way that it had not had uh, before. We're very encouraged by this, uh, the new communities program and what it can do. Uh, this is the kind of comprehensive planning that uh, we uh, hope the city can embrace. The other big community building effort in the city was the plan for transformation, which tore down large public housing developments and rebuilt them in mixed income new urbanist communities. This was also a, a very aggressive effort to remake communities. Uh, people in the room, I'm sure, are involved in this. This is um, a big challenge. How do you uh, tear down, rebuild, create community? Uh, it's an important effort, one that needs to be finished. Uh, I've argued that those high rises needed to come down, but we need to think carefully about the types of communities we're building and how to finish this effort so that we can grow the supply of affordable housing in the city. The CHA needs another plan for the next 30 years uh, after they've finally kind of finished undoing uh, the mistakes of their past. But we're not thinking as systematically about our neighborhoods uh, as we should. The city, uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel has Chicago Neighborhoods Now initiative. This is all uh, uh, lots of nice projects, but they were announced in seven neighborhoods and picked over a period of about a month. Uh, they're not, this is not the kind of comprehensive systematic planning we need. Are any of these developed projects good ones? Yes, but where's the, uh, the systematic thinking? For instance, the foreclosure impact uh, which has really devastated a lot of neighborhoods, is not incorporated in much of this, um, nor do we see connections to uh, CHA and the LISC efforts that uh, have made some progress. And we still have this major concern about two cities developing in the city. Let me show you this graphically using the last set of census data. Uh, this is 2000 to 2010 population change, a lot of dots on this page, but let me focus you on the fo uh, upper corner here. Uh, this measures non-Hispanic whites and where they're moving. So uh, the green means people moving in, this is good, a lot of whites moved into the north side, that's the boom we see. But we also lost a lot of people on the northwest side, southwest side, and other neighborhoods. The net, uh, we had a net loss of non-Hispanic whites in the last decade. Even worse, we lost uh, 180,000 African Americans. That's this chart. Uh, and they were uh, looking for the American dream, moving to the suburbs, leaving high crime uh, communities where the education systems were uh, not appealing. And we lost 180,000. That's a huge number. We can't keep bleeding like this. Uh, and so these are, are real challenges that we face uh, for our future. That sounds dismal, but let me also say that what we need for the city for the next decade is to think about how we're going to attract more immigrants. This set of charts shows four cities, Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis, and the main takeaway here is that Chicago has attracted immigrants far better than our other Midwestern competitors. The green line here is the uh, proportion of Hispanics, and the purple line at the top is uh, the, our Asian immigrants. And because we captured a whole lot of immigrants, our population losses were far less than other Midwestern cities that captured very few Hispanics and Asians. Uh, we need to think about where the next set of immigrants are going to come. We know that the Hispanic uh, migration slowed uh, after the recession. Uh, we need more people because cities constantly throughout their history have required constant uh, immigration to, to fill our neighborhoods. Um, we also have two other challenges, and I'm going to then turn it over to John, who's going to bring it home. You know what? Planning is crucial. Uh, why don't you sum it up so we can get John oh, okay. to ask questions? Okay. All right. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Green. Uh, two points. Uh, tax increment financing districts are now blank at the city, and the problem with these is not that any individual uh, tax TIF district is uh, bad or good. It's that when 150 of them blank at the city, we uh, lack, it distorts our capital budgeting. 
TIF districts are little honey pots where tax, taxes are separated into these, and then they can only be used in the district. So now we lack uh, the kind of comprehensive planning over, uh, over the city to allocate our capital budget um, wisely. And as a result, we've kind of lost control in a, will, in a way of that capital budget and ended up borrowing an awful lot of money uh, in ways that you see here. Um, so we're, these are major challenges that we face as we go forward. I'm going to have John just for a minute. A quick wrap up. Thanks. Paul. Thanks, Paul. You're on the clock. You're on the clock. So, Brad talked about the fiscal challenges of the city, and, and believe me, we, we're sympathetic. There's a drinking from the fire hose when you inherit uh, some of the fiscal challenges that the city does. But we are functioning without the resources we need to even think about them. We're functioning with 40% less resources in terms of personnel and resources in the whole planning area. We've had a, a pivot towards the pri privatization of planning. Uh, World Business Chicago is uh, coming out of the Boeing effort. We learned we needed to do something like that, and, it, and it's a great organization, but it's no substitute for long-range uh, neighborhood-based planning. And there has been, I think, a major focus on business recruitment. Mm. We see five areas that need uh, to be addressed and brought into the conversation. Increasing transit investment and capacity. And we don't say that because all planners say you need more transit. We're saying it for a very concrete reason for Chicago. If Chicago is going to remain the growth center of the region and the 60% of our white collar growth is going to be in the central area, we need to efficiently move people in and out and we're falling way behind. Eight billion of the 12 billion talked about in the central area action plan was just to bring the current system up to standard. We're not talking about monorails and pie in the sky. We're just talking about bringing our system up to the present. Repopulating the neighborhoods, Brad's talked about that. Adapting the industrial policy, I've talked about that. Implementing the central area action plan and others. We've got a lot of good plans done. We don't have to start from scratch. We can, we can go back to some of these plans, update them, and put them into practice. And assert planning as a key way that the city makes decisions. Uh, we don't see that right now. Mm. So what have we been doing the last few months and with this book? We hope what we're doing, and thank you for hosting us today, is to create what we're calling a civic conversation, public policy conversation. Public conversation includes a wide range of groups, foundations that might be interested, the universities and the institutes, and a city hall conversation that includes all the relevant agencies and related agencies. We can't wait, given these population numbers and these employment numbers, we can't wait three years to do a plan. Plans take a little while. So what we're saying, let's do an interim. Let's think about doing something in the interim. Let's update the data we have. Let's review all our current plans. Let's think about how we can focus our investments very strategically over the next two, three, and four years, based largely on the work we've done. And then at the same time, let's launch a new comprehensive plan, that one that covers the whole city, one that, like the 1966 plan, covered all aspects of quality of life here, something that could be publicly and privately funded. I think the foundations will step to the plate they have in the past. We know we don't have 701 grant money from the feds. We know that. But there is a lot, there are a lot of resources in this community that could be brought to bear. We are going to suggest you can't get anywhere unless you catch the public imagination. We're going to say, let's try to get this complete by 2016 which would be the 50th anniversary of our 1966 plan, and let's create a vision for 2033, which would be our bicentennial. And wouldn't it be nice to come into our bicentennial with a set of plans that prepared us for the next century, and maybe even a new Wacker manual to teach all of this to our kids. Thank you very much. Let's try this from the seated position. Will that work? Is that live? Uh, yeah, we're on, I'm, we're on the Paul Green clock here. So uh, it's and it's intimidating because um, I see a lot of my sources here, you know, and I, <laughs> uh, and good sources too. Good sources are people who answer the telephone one and they say, John, I'm shocked and outraged. What's a question? And 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 then we go from there. Um, the only criticism I would make. Of, of Brad and John's new book, Planning Chicago, is that it wasn't available uh, to me as a reference tool uh, back during the 80s and 90s uh, when I was covering urban development for the Tribune. Um, 
that was the dawn of the digital age, so uh, you know the Trib still kept a library uh, off the city room called the morgue. And uh, if you wanted, if you wanted to know something, you you know this this room was filled wall to wall with uh, with file cabinets full of little envelopes um, that were in turn filled with little newspaper clippings uh, on every subject the Trib ever wrote about. Um, they didn't encourage you to source things outside of the Tribune, because of course the Tribune got it right every time, and, and you couldn't really trust uh, what you'd find in a regular library. Anyway, um, so if you wanted to look up, say, how it came to be that the city of Chicago um, intentionally uh, built the nation's largest concentration of housing for the desperately poor on South State Street, uh, you'd call for the clips uh, on Robert Taylor Holmes, and, um, and then the librarian in the morgue would uh, send that out to you uh, via pneumatic tube. There were pneumatic tubes throughout the Tribune City Room and these little things that looked like artillery shells would come shooting through and a, a, a copy, copy person, uh, they were no longer then called copy boys, uh, would, would deliver them to your desk and, and you'd sort through them and you'd pull out these 30-year-old strips of newsprint and, and um, all yellow and brittle with age and, and you'd read what, uh, let's say, Tom Buck or uh, Paul Gap, one of my special mentors at the Tribune, uh, what they had to say um, years back about the, um, the early days of the Chicago Housing Authority. But now, uh, thanks to these guys and, and others like them, um, we have all these well-researched books, uh, such as, for instance, the Encyclopedia of Chicago, which uh, is online and searchable, uh, published by the University of Chicago. We have um, several recent books by uh, Joe Schwederman, uh, DePaul's Man for All Seasons. I know this is a Roosevelt day here, but... Uh, <laughs> DePaul's done excellent work in this area, too, uh, notably about the evolution of post-war suburbia uh, in the history of zoning in Chicago. And now, ta-da, we have um, Brad and John with their post-war history of planning, uh, a work that reflects, I think, um, a genuine understanding of how the world of planning and development really works. And, and by this, I mean that Brad and John acknowledge in the book that, sure, politics does play a role in decision making. Um, this, this being Chicago, you do need the alderman on board, uh, especially if he or she is the, also the ward committeeman. Um, and, and it never hurts to have, uh, you know, to hire a lawyer friend of the mayor to, uh, to present your project's application before the plan commission uh, or, 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 the, or the zoning committee. Uh, Jack Guthman uh, never, never, of course, did that. He was, he was nobody's friend, right? And, and Reuben Hedlund, <laughs> Reuben Hedlund over there, who I covered for years, who chaired the plan commission, uh, he, he wouldn't uh, uh, take that into consideration uh, at all. But, but, but still the book recognizes that the actual merits of the plan, the issues involved, surely do matter as much as the politics. Uh, what's more, Brad and John explain that the political motivations of the mayor and of the alderman uh, most often coincide with what they believe is best for the community something that's often lost, I think, in, in today's coverage. Or, or in the words of uh, Chicago's own Richard I, often quoted by Professor Green, uh, good government is, good thank you, is good politics. Um, now I ask you to contrast um, that sort of rounded view of the way the world works, of public decision making, that, that planning issues do matter, um, with the way much of the news uh, media today now reports on civic affairs. Um, uh, in other words, I'm, I figured, how could I get on thin ice today? Well, I could do some press criticism. Um, nowadays, a lot of journalists focus, prim um, um, those, those who still focus primarily on the issues, on the planning pros and cons of a project, um, they're thought to be somewhat naive. Um, political cynicism uh, it often seems, is the new mark of repertorial uh, sophistication. So, for instance, investing tax dollars on public works infrastructure is often dismissed um, as pork barrel spending. And, and stories about major developments often dwell on the political connections and contributions of the contractors and the consultants, rather than on the merits or the, or the drawbacks of what's being uh, planned or developed. Um, if you remember, much of the early reporting on the development of Millennium Park, uh, for instance, was um, concerned who was to blame for the cracks in the cement pylons that supported the park platform over that underground parking 
garage, or, or the fact that the, um, the cost of the project was running far in excess of the $150 million that uh, Mayor Daley II uh, originally said it would cost. Well, of course it was running over because you had John Bryan and other civic leaders running around town uh, shaming one another into donating enormous amounts of money for uh, the things that we now love about you know, Millennial Park, things, and some of those things needed uh, additional uh, infrastructure support. I mean, you had to get water for that electric photograph to spit at the uh, kids in the pool, right? Um, <laughs> Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that, that journalists uh, put on rose-colored glasses uh, before covering urban affairs. Uh, Screw-ups like we're seeing um, with the CTA's new venture cards uh, need to be exposed, written about, and explained. Uh, but I would hope that the next gen of urban reporters, uh, if there's to be one, um, avoid letting cynicism get in the way of, uh, of understanding. And uh, I did just to prove I also brought some visual aids, no PowerPoint, but here's, but here's a, a clip, for instance, from last Sunday's Tribune. Um, and it's about, it's about a new metro station being planned uh, for the uh, uh, community of uh, Auburn Gresham, which is one of the communities that LISC has been helping out. And I've been writing for LISC a lot lately. And I see Carolyn Goldstein is here for, for LISC. Ra shake, your, uh, shake your napkin, Carolyn. They're, they're, okay, well, you're wavering. Um, so, uh, so here, the, the headline, I mean, this is a, a community just south of, uh, of Englewood uh, that, that uh, is still very viable, a lot of bungalows and uh, uh, two flats, um, but, it, but it needs a shot in the arm. It needs uh, uh, something that would support people who go to work every day. And so there's talk of, you know, we're going to do a metro station down there. And the headline on the story is Metra, Stations Funding Political. And it goes on, uh, Mayor's plans to build a 20, Metra's plans to build a $20 million station on the south side uh, uh, prompted an unusual candid explanation of the political back scratching behind the project. I mean, this is a, a, a metro station for, for a community that uh, desperately uh, needs one, and yet the, you know, the author who's by the way, an excellent reporter, I think, in, uh, in many respects, uh, felt it necessary to say, uh, well, there's even a sentence here saying that the state representative from down that way was talking to the governor in private about this. Uh, can you imagine, can you imagine that? And that the governor wanted, wanted her to vote for the overall uh, uh, public uh, works bond issue, uh, et cetera. Anyway, but I won't, I won't beat that to death. The beauty of planning Chicago that these guys wrote is, is that it doesn't fall into this trap of easy cynicism. Uh, sure, Brad and, 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 and John uh, give due mention to the politics involved, but they also explain how this or that project aimed to address the, the larger forces at work on our city, uh, be it uh, deindustrialization or globalization or the struggle to keep middle class families in the city without uh, displacing poor folks. Um, now, if the press has become too cynical in writing about this stuff, uh, let me skate further out onto the thin ice and let me assert that, um, and aim my pop gun uh, in another direction, and that is our not-for-profit uh, community, our, our planning advocacy community, which it seems to me is becoming more and more whimsical in their uh, approach to planning for the, our future. Um, again, I'm not naming names here, but all sorts of, um, of, in my view, unworkable ideas are being proposed for our city under the banner of green and sustainable. Um, so we're, we're going to grab two lanes of traffic from Ashland Avenue for something called bus rapid transit. And uh, then we're going to grab two lanes from uh, Washington and Madison Streets in the heart of the loop, all in the name of becoming more green and sustainable. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think bus rapid transit is a worthwhile idea. It has a place in the transit mix. I even think dedicated bicycle lanes are a good idea, uh, but not at the expense of grabbing vehicle lanes um, on already congested arterial streets. And I think that the city is going along with this, the mayor is going along with this, because he realizes there's no money, really, now that we've done the red line, uh, there's no money for, for big stuff coming from Washington, so we're going to get buckets of paint and and, uh, and dedicate lanes on, on existing streets. Um, I, it, apparently, I, you know, I just drove here today, I had to drive because I was coming in from Lawndale and uh, 
kept running into trouble with delivery trucks, beer trucks, you know, and I'm thinking, how, you know, how are these, how is this going to work uh, uh, with the beer trucks on uh, Madison Street? But <clears throat> um, one of the great accomplishments of Chicago, I think, is that Monday through Friday, we're able to transport almost a half million people to and from the Central Business District. Half million people every day. Yet one of the great failings of Chicago is that once we bring that half million downtown via our world-class rail systems, light rail, heavy rail, we have no comparable way to move them that last mile or two to their office or to the, our big convention center, to the lakefront parks and stadiums, museums, or to our ever-expanding hospital complex in Streeterville. Um, I submit that, that neither divvy bikes or, um, or the back and forth bus lanes on Washington and Madison are a solution to that problem. Uh, what we need, I think, is an off street busway, a super loop, if you will, and we need to make a commitment to it soon while we still have the old railroad rights away uh, in which to build it. Um, but I've already, I think, killed too many Canadian trees writing in the Tribune about my version of the uh, off street circulator. So what I'll do is zip my lip. We're probably running over time and, uh, and, and let the sustainable Professor Green um, open up our discussion, <laughs> open up our discussion to the floor um, because I see there are uh, uh, many experts out there on the dining room floor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you John, for most of that. Uh. <laughs> I have one question. We're only going to take a couple because we always want to end on time and, uh, you know, planning sometimes becomes somewhat uh, theoretical, so uh, 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 we're, we're, we're a little behind. So I, I apologize if everyone has to leave. This will be done in, in five minutes. That's it. I'm on, I'm on my own clock. You'll be out of here by uh, 125 for sure. And uh, before I go, because I have to say this because he's on the Board of Trustees, Brad's mom and dad are here, uh, uh, Don and Jane Hunt. Where are you? There they are. Where are they? They're back. Way in the back. We don't allow family to get too close. Okay. Uh, this is Steve Schlickman. All, all, you all know who Steve is. UIC Urban Transportation Center and been around trans transit, um, all kinds of transit authorities. Is there a role for regional planning, such as Go to 2040, in creating a comprehensive plan for Chicago? 30 seconds each. Yeah, there is. Um, and I think that uh, all of the plans we're talking about would integrate with the, with the CMAP transportation plans. Um, I think when, with CMAP being our primary locus of regional transportation planning right now, and it should be, it's our policy focus, um, uh, we do have an obligation to, to work through their structure and their, and their approval processes, as we've discovered with the Ileana decision recently. But the, the real key is uh, CMAP also needs a strong planning partner with the city. And I think they'll be the first to say uh, the city has a lot of wonderful people, but, but uh, as a partnership, uh, we're not getting the collaboration that we need to get those improvements in the region and those improvements in the city coordinated and planned and for us to go to the public together and, uh, and try to get them funded. Thank you. John. Uh, well, I'll, I'll take a, a quick one here. Um, I think the answer is yes, but I think let's have it linked into the political process as well. Uh, process, I should yeah. state. Let, let's have some people with some real power. You know, let's face it, in Illinois, we, we have a, a caucus-driven state. There's the four tops and the governor. Well, the four tops anyway. And uh, One top and the governor. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's true. But um, let's have a link. I'll never forget, uh, I was really heartened. I really thought planning made a difference once um, early in my career when, uh, when uh, uh, George Ryan was running for governor and he was brought to the Tribune editorial board where I just uh, joined, uh, not by some aid, but by George Ranney, one of our leading um, regional planning minds. And I'm thinking, boy, there really are some few linkages between planning and politics in this, in this state. Um, there ought to be a lot more. Uh, the last question is from Neil Gallagher, and uh, Brad, this is for you because you haven't said anything uh, on these questions, all these questions. That's it. We just have no time. Neil Gallagher, Fulton Grace Realty, broker. What, what is the current status of city planning development? 
Net positive, net negative, or other. Do you think more centralized power with the, is that with the mayor? Yeah, with the mayor's office. With the mayor, would be better than current city council? Well, we lack a, a strong public presence in planning in this city because we do not have a department of city planning. We do not have a strong voice that says we need to think systematically about our future. And when you don't have that, and other cities do this really well, um, New York has a comprehensive plan, D uh, Dallas, uh, Miami, Denver, and they have all been expanding and doing really great things. Uh, in ways that we're, we're kind of resting on our laurels. I think we do need a strong public presence in planning, and I think that's what we lack right now. Instead, we have a fractured uh, fabric and a fa fractured framework that then um, may, leads us to, to not use our resources wisely. I'm told, I'm told they are gonna put planning back on the door on the 10th floor very, uh, very soon. Uh, and you know, Rich Daly, uh, I mean, I, Peter Scozzi used to keep, at the planning council, used to keep track of how many plan commissioners we had. And we were pushing 20, you know, and, and under, under Rich Daly. Finally, I think we've got a guy in Andy Mooney who really understands this stuff and how it all fits together, the political and the, uh, and the, and the esoteric. The, the main problem is money. Uh, you know, the re, uh, Republicans are uh, running the House now. Uh, Jim Oberstar is no longer <laughs> running the Transportation Committee, and, uh, and we're running on, on fumes. So uh, I think, again, that's one reason why we're, we're striping off lanes on, uh, in the loop is because we really don't have the money to, to do some of the big things that are being written about. How about a big round of applause? This is very educational.